Hi, good morning, everyone. We're going to wait about two more minutes, and then we're going to go ahead and get going. Okay, good morning, everyone. It's 11 o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the webinar. Uh, thank you, guys, everyone who's logged on so far. We're excited about this webinar, the last one in the series. So we're going to talk about invasive species, both plants and pests in urban forests and the impacts they have. Um, you're familiar with myself, Chris Lepetiuk, and Francis Waite, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Dave Coyle from Clemson. Okay, as always, we're gonna do a little bit of orientating to the platform so we all know how to work it. Um, we do have polls in this webinar. There are two that are open right now. If you don't mind, just click on the bottom right-hand corner where the, where the mouse is moving to click on the poll. Go ahead and answer those questions. Those really help us to know who our audience is and how we can better provide you guys the answers you're looking for. We also have an ask a question feature in there. If you don't mind typing in your content questions. So questions for Dr. Coyle. And we also have the chat as you guys have already done. Please type in there, say hello, say good morning, say glad to see you. And if you're having any problems with audio or visual, please go ahead and write that in there so we can help you. We are sad that we don't have Lau this morning. He is out on vacation. So happy for him, but sad for us. Uh, so you're going to have to bear with me helping you with uh, connection problems. And now I'm going to turn it over to Francis Wade, who's going to do a quick thank you. Yes, thank you guys for um, coming and joining us today. We really appreciate your support and um, hope you're enjoying the planning credits if, if they're needed. Um, I want to go over the agenda now today. Um, so what Dr. Coyle is going to talk about is, um, you know, why trees are perpetually stressed. What does a change in climate mean for trees? What are some invasive pests you might encounter? What should you in do if you encounter them? And um, what sort of plant should we be planting and, and specifying? And I also want to introduce myself. If you don't know me, I'm Francis Waite. Um, and this webinar series is provided by a grant from the U.S. Forest Service to the Forestry Commission Urban and Community Forestry Program. Um, our program's mission is to help municipalities and counties build capacity in their own urban and community forestry programs. And we're partnering today with Plan Green to provide today's webinar. And I want to welcome you all um, to our webinar series to give commissioners and advisory board members the tools needed to help you when you're having discussions regarding trees and urban forests. And we're welcome. Dr. David Quill from Clemson Extension today, and we hope to give you some ideas and concepts to consider in your decision-making processes. And I'm gonna hand this back over to Chris now. Okay, I'm Chris Lepetuk with Plan Green. We work with communities large and small across the country on harnessing the value of green infrastructure and how to plan more livable communities. Um, we have a mission of ensuring that all people, no matter their station in life, have a right to a clean, healthy, and green environment in which to live. So if you, we are definitely glad to have you here. Uh, as you guys know, we do provide credits, free credits for these sessions. If you need credits, please email me. The credits we're providing are the SCPEAC, also known as the Planners Commissioner's Credits. If you need Arborist Credits, we have those as well, and AICP, which are the Planners Credits. Again, please email me at the email listed, listed below. And I will give you either a certificate for the SCPEAC or I will just take your ISA number for the ISA or I can tell you how to log your own planner's credits. Okay, 
Um, we So this is the third and last webinar in this series. We've been through the first one in July on environmental justice and urban forestry, the second one, which was just in September, and here we are on invasive species. Um, if you guys have any if you guys have any thoughts for other events, other topics that you would want to hear about, please type it in the chat or email me so that we can help plan what else you guys want to know about, either just out of interest or because it's a professional, professional question in your planning commissioner role. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Francis to, to talk about the, um, actually, I apologize. I'm going to talk about the other resources. Um, so the SCFC Urban and Community Forestry Program just had a grant webinar, and this is a grant webinar that talked about opportunities for municipalities and counties. So again, the only people that can apply for those are municipality and municipalities and counties. If you would like to see a recording of that, whether or not you work for municipality or county, we're going to pop, we're going to tell you where you can find that recording. It's not available today. It'll be available tomorrow because the, the grant was, the webinar was just yesterday. We also want to talk about the Trees SC Conference, which is going to be held in Greenville, October 27th and 28th. If you want any more information about that, please reach out either in the chat or email. And we have one more webinar coming up on December, December 8th, which is about root and heart rot in pines. We already have the registration link for that, so it's going to be popped in the chat box shortly. Okay, now we don't, we're don't. we not going to go to the questions and comments slide. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen and invite Dr. Coyle up to share his screen. So just give me one second. Okay, and take it away. All right, everybody, I trust we are seeing that title slide. So thank you, uh, Chris and Francis, for having me. And I'm glad that I'm here today because this is a group that I don't usually get to talk to. So let's talk a little bit about trees and what makes trees healthy, what makes them sad, and some of the pests that we can deal with in some of these urban areas. I think Francis gave a good synopsis of what we're going to do. So let's just get started. So before we go, uh, I want to just give you a little disclaimer. Um, I've got lots of Lots of opinions that I will share with you today that I've gathered over 20 plus years doing this, but I've also got lots of facts that I will share as well, and I will make sure you know what is what, so be aware. So let's first start with general tree health, and by general tree health, I mean what is it, why does it matter, why do we care, and what impacts general tree health, because this is important for any tree, you know, anytime you're trying to put a tree in a landscape, there's some things to think about. So what is a healthy tree is kind of a, a very broad question, but you know, in, from what I have learned and in my opinion, this is kind of a typical healthy tree. You've got one main trunk, you've got a relatively insect and disease free, you know, some uh, defoliation is natural, especially on native species, but lots of healthy leaves, a good full canopy, full branches. It's growing vigorously and there's no, you know, apparent outward defects structurally or that type of thing. So that's a healthy tree, right? What's a healthy forest or a healthy urban forest? That's just a collection of healthy trees, you know, and it, it kind of, the definition of a healthy forest really depends um, on sort of what your objective is. You know, forest health in general means something without humans there. If there's no humans, a healthy forest has a combination of living trees, dying trees, dead trees, things eating the trees, things eating the other things. There's lots of life going on. Um, when you're talking about a healthy urban forest though, you typically don't want a lot of dead stuff because A, they can be hazards, and B, that's just not what people don't want to walk in a park if it's half dead, right? So so the definition of a healthy urban forest changes a little bit from a healthy uh, you know, natural forest, but there is still a healthy forest and that all gets back to how how are those individual trees performing? So when we think about individual trees in an urban landscape, you know, urban, suburban, whatever, what have you, these things face a lot of challenges that trees out in the natural system, out on the back 40, never have to have to deal with. 
they've got different precipitation uh, patterns and events, rain, there's ice, there's a chance of more flooding in some of these areas because you've got so much impervious surface and water can only go in certain areas. Wind patterns are changed in urban areas because of the buildings. Uh, you've got different types of pollution in urban areas. I mean, a lot of times you can just look on the ground and see how gross people are throwing stuff all over the place. Uh, pests are still going to be in urban areas. Pests don't particularly care where the tree is planted. If it's something they can eat, they will try to eat it. And then humans, we'll talk about humans. And then finally, temperature, because the way our cities are constructed, because of that impervious surface, we have a lot of temperature issues that we need to deal with. Now, the first website I'm going to show you, and I believe Chris is going to get you all these slides uh, at the end of the day, along with some other materials. But this is the U.S. Drought Monitor, and this gets updated every week, and it basically just shows you where in the U.S. is it dry. Uh, the more red it is, you can see the, the deep red is that exceptional drought. Most of the southeast right now is in a mild drought, abnormally dry. That being said, you know, this is from two days ago when we had a bunch of rain come up through Georgia and South Carolina and even North Carolina today. So this is something that I check fairly frequently and it will show you, you know, the more red it is, the more dry it is. And when it's dry, you get a lot of tree stress. And then there's the whole issue of urban heat islands, the urban heat island effect. So this is an aerial shot of Washington, D.C., our capital, right? And if you look here, you can circle a few areas that have a lot of green in them. These are natural areas. So there's a, a national park along the river, some other national areas there are natural areas. And then this big chunk right in the middle, see in the kind of in the dead center of the screen is the US Capitol. So this is that really urbanized area right around it. If you look at this exact picture, if you look at how much heat comes off of that, you can see it is pretty much mirrors where there is impervious surface. So the light blue stuff is where it's much cooler. And if you look back, this is areas where there's lots of green planted. The dark, dark reddish stuff right in the center there, if you look back, that's where all the buildings and streets are. So the, this is just a very common thing, this urban heat island effect. When you plant trees in places where there's lots of pavement and lots of blacktop, they are going to be much more uh, they're going to have much more heat on them than their, their counterparts in some of those natural areas. And so what does that mean for the trees? This is kind of the, the crux of the question. Like, well, who cares? Well, a lot of really smart people have done a lot of good work on this, and they found a few things. They found that as the heat goes up and you get these warmer nights, trees lose more water out of their leaves. That's just as part of how trees grow and respire and breathe, essentially, right? So as it's warmer, they lose more water in their leaves. Uh, and when it's really hot, photosynthesis decreases. The rate at which that tree can make its own food decreases. Okay, so that happens when it gets hot. And then when it's hot, that basically means a tree can't make and store as much energy. Trees make food through photosynthesis. They take those, those things they make and they shove them down in the roots. And the roots are basically the pantry. So they're just storing all this food for any time a tree is injured. It has to take stuff from the pantry. It has to take energy from the roots and repair itself. Hardwood trees that lose their leaves in the fall when they flush out in the spring, they're pulling resources from their roots to put all those new leaves out. If a tree is defoliated by uh, caterpillars, it has to take reserves from its roots and put new leaves on. And so all this sort of means when it's warm, they're losing water. They can't make as much food. They can't store as much food. So you have this perpetually stressed tree. This is very common for trees in urban environments. And then beyond that, you've got certain things that people do. Uh, how we take care of trees is absolutely critical for them to survive. Mulching is a great thing for trees. Putting mulch into a volcano is absolutely not. So if you know someone that does this, or if you do this, I'm begging you, please stop doing this. All this thing is doing is making it wet and moist and humid at the base of that tree, and that just leads to rots. Mulch is not needed like this. Soil compaction. This is a common site, you know, and in parking lots, you see where a lot of people walk all the time. That soil is rock hard, and that tree is trying as best it can to get those roots through there. You've got soil quality. 
if the soil in our urban areas looked like this picture, we probably wouldn't be having a lot of these conversations because everything would look great. But unfortunately, most urban soil looks like this and you've got layers of who knows what's in there. You've got all sorts of degraded uh, spaces. You've got soil that gets moved around from construction. They might take it from one spot, put it onto another spot. Things get moved around and the soil profile gets all messed up. Exposed roots, this is kind of similar to some of that, um, you know, those pictures we saw earlier, but these roots are really just out there, exposed, nothing is protecting them. This would be a great place to put some mulch, right? Cover those roots up. And when you've got those exposed roots and you've got grass growing right up to the base of a tree, they are at a lot of damage for two different physical things, what we call weed eater blight, which is when your weed eater hits the base of that tree, and then also lawnmowers. Those exposed roots we just saw in the picture before are classic for getting mowed over by lawnmowers. And when you mow over the root, you shave some of it off, you basically just make a big wound on that root. Anytime there's a wound on a tree, there is a chance for infection to get in that tree by way of a, a fungus. And people are a huge tree stressor. Uh, I live in, you know, we work in a college town and Tony Tidwell, who is our city of Clemson horticulturalist, once told me that the biggest threat to urban tree health is 18 to 22 year old males on Saturdays in the fall. Clemson is not alone. Pick any, any town with a large university or any town where there's big events going on. People are gonna people and they're gonna do some things to your trees, especially once the sun goes down. It's just a simple fact of life. So, you know, what they've started doing in Clemson is putting up actual barriers, physical barriers. And this is this is from downtown Clemson. They're just these little, you know, metal barriers. They seem to do the trick. It's, you know, sometimes people don't need a lot. They just need a little something to keep them off. That being said, if you leave these things on in perpetuity, eventually trees are going to outgrow them. So this, this is just as bad, right? Having a barrier where the tree is basically grown into it and, you know, starting to engulf it. So that's just as bad. So in the urban area, you've got this perpetually stressed tree from both environmental factors, physical factors, people. You've got a stressed tree. This is very common across the landscape. And so then let's talk a little bit about the pests, okay? As, as we are in this era of climate change and as we have, again, warmer temperatures in urban areas compared to some of those natural areas, insects are ectotherms, which means their body temperature is the same as the temperature outside. And that's simply what this graph shows is your outside temperature goes up, the body temperature of an insect goes up. That's why if you walk out in the morning and it's 50 degrees, you usually see insects just kind of sitting on leaves because they don't have enough heat. They can't get themselves moving yet. Go out again when it's 85 and there's stuff flying all around the place because everything's warmed up and ready to go. And when you have a warmer body as an insect, you can grow larger and you can grow larger faster. So let's take a look at this. We've got some very hungry caterpillars here, okay? So these three little hungry caterpillars are growing in three different uh, environments. So at the top one, it's 66 degrees during the day, 61 at night. The bottom is 77 and 72. So you've got basically an 11 degree difference going from top to bottom. And there's two lines that basically just means a low nitrogen, a high nitrogen diet, basically a healthy diet and not so healthy diet. But what you see is even at that low temperature, right, that caterpillar is gonna get to maturity. It's gonna get big enough to, to form pupa and come out as a beautiful butterfly, right? It takes about 56, what is that, 49, seven, eight weeks to get there. As you increase that temperature, that caterpillar is going to get bigger and it's going to get bigger at a faster rate because of the temperature. So if you just, an 11 degree difference, you will still get a mature caterpillar at the end of each one, except the one that's warmer is gonna do it in almost half the time, and it's gonna get much larger than the other one would get. This is just insect biology 101. So where you've got an environment where you've got already stressed trees, you've got higher temperatures, and now you've got insects that are growing bigger, growing faster, and when they grow faster, that means there's a chance for them to have more generations in a given year. When we look at fungi, uh, that it's basically the same pattern. So you see that if it's too cold, they're not going to grow. Uh, if it's too hot, they die. But sort of as that temperature grows up, the fungi are going to grow 
a lot faster. So what all this means for all these trees is that most, you know, most urban trees, I think it's fair to say, are physically and physiologically stressed pretty much from day one. Um, you've got lots of different factors affecting tree health. Most tree pests, especially some of the ones we'll talk about today, only impact stressed trees. We really don't have a lot of tree pests in North America that affect a healthy tree. There's a few things that will outbreak every now and again, but by and large, most of the stuff we have, gnawing on trees, is just going to do this to a stressed tree. Uh, that urban environment, again, is the perfect storm of stress factors, and what that typically means is you get a lot of declines in trees. You get trees that start looking uh, looking scuzzy at, you know, much sooner than you would expect. And then you get pests all over the place. So I said this before, I'll say it again, pests don't care where the trees are. So this is a, a area outside of uh, Daytona, Florida. It's a neighborhood, but you have a traditionally a natural forest pest, Southern pine beetle having an outbreak right there. Pine beetles eat pine trees. And if there's pine trees, they're going to find them. So let's talk a little bit about some of these pests. You know, primary versus secondary pests is something that people uh, in my business say quite a bit. A primary pest is a pest that can attack a healthy tree. Very simple. Um, most of the time, and well, all invasive species are typically primary pests because they are going to be attacking those healthy trees. Again, most native species are secondary pests. So when a tree gets stressed, it gives off certain chemicals. Those chemicals are easily smelled or detected by some of these native pests, and that's when they come and start feeding. Again, secondary pests respond to stressed trees. So one of the take-home messages today is if, you, if you're planting a tree, you want to put it in an environment and give it the best chance to survive without stress. Because if that tree survives without stress, it's very likely not going to have any pests on it. So let's go over a few of the common pests we have of managed trees. We've got some hardwood pests, we've got some pine pests. I wanna start with pine bark beetles. These are, there's about seven down here in the Southeast. Uh, there's Ips on the side, you've got Dendroctinus. So basically you've got Southern pine beetle, which is the really tiny one down here in the, in the lower right. You've got turpentine beetles, which are the big Dendroctinus, and you've got these Ips beetles, which all kind of look the same going from kind of large to small. The southern pine beetle. Now, I know I told you most native pests don't attack healthy trees. Here's one exception, okay? <clears throat> the southern pine beetle is capable of massive outbreaks, and that is what you're seeing in this picture right here. It is a huge outbreak. All of those red-brown trees were killed by the southern pine beetle. If you look closely, you can see in the center, so this looks like a donut, in that very green center, those trees have been dead so long that other trees grew up in there to take their place. And as you're coming out from the center, you can see the trees go from brown, which means they're dead and lost all their needles, to red. So they're dead, but the needles are hanging on. Some of them on the edge are a little bit yellow. Those are just starting to die. And then you've got some on the very outer edge that look like they're kind of a light green. Those are basically just in the very, very early stages of being I mean, a beetle. So these beetles find these trees. Once they get going, they will attack this tree in mass. These are little pitch tubes, so as each beetle chews its way into the pine tree, the pine tree tries to kick off, it tries to put out some sap to, to catch it and entomb it. It often, it often works, but when there's so many attacks, there's just too many beetles, and the pine tree can't do it. Pine tree, or the uh, southern pine beetle will lay eggs inside there, and then you see these little larvae feed, they girdle the phloem, they feed on the phloem, and that is, again, the living part of the tree inside the bark and then they make these big galleries and consume that foam. Uh, southern pine beetles are typically uncommon, except when they outbreak, in which case they are all over the place. And there's a number of things that um, typically lead to pine, southern pine beetle outbreaks. Uh, the whole key though is, is tree stress a lot of the times. And now we've got, <clears throat> we've got Ips bark beetles, and these are similar to southern pine beetles, but they're just not as aggressive. Uh, Ips bark beetles are common pretty much all over the place, and they are your quintessential secondary pest. They're going to attack trees that are stressed. The male attacks first, digs the gallery, <clears throat> excuse me, calls the female in, and then the, the damage ensues from there. Typically, you can find Ips uh, in places like this, in a branch that might be dead or a broken branch off the wind. 
uh, you know, these pictures were from Georgia and the one on the right was just driving down the road and there's a little dead branch there with Ips in it. And the other one was taken on the experimental forest at the University of Georgia. This branch broke off in a windstorm and it was completely loaded with Ips beetles and there wasn't a single Ips beetle in any of the other surrounding trees because they were healthy, right? So Ips are kind of there just picking off the, the you know, the weak, the dead and the broken, if you will. Ips trees, you know, have this branch flagging and fading crown. It's very, very noticeable by most people. They get your call, you know, you get your calls. Wow, my tree's turning brown. What's happening? Uh, similar to the southern pine beetle, they dig a hole. Uh, they start chewing their way in. The pine tree tries to pitch it out. Here you can see it was unsuccessful because you see there's a little hole going right down the middle of that pitch. That means that beetle got in and is doing some damage. Turpentine beetles are similar to Ips in that they're secondary pests. They're not very aggressive. They typically attack the bottom 10 feet or so of the tree, and they're just much larger. You get really, really big pitch tubes from box turpentine beetles. And these are very common if there has been any type of fire, if there has been any type of physical damage, like if a, a truck or something has run into the bottom of a tree, um, that is when you commonly will get black turpentine beetles. Same if there's construction happening and you damage a bunch of the tree roots, that can weaken the tree enough to get Ips and turpentine beetles. <clears throat> now I've mentioned um, the importance of tree health. You know, pine health is, is key to keeping these things away. And I wanna just reiterate the importance of, each tree can protect itself to a certain extent, right? So a healthy pine tree can protect itself. So this tree on the right, it was perfectly healthy. I put up a bunch of baits on it to basically trick all the beetles in the area to thinking this tree was stressed. So the beetles came to the tree and you can see there's pitch tubes all over the place. So some of the first beetles that came got to this really healthy tree and it had a huge pitch response. There's this pitch all over the place and it completely kept them out. But as more beetles kept attacking, remember I tricked them into thinking this tree was unhealthy the pitch tubes get smaller because that tree is just running out of gas. And you can see this is still a fairly good sized pitch tube, but there's a little hole right there where that beetle got in. And then as more beetles come and more beetles come, eventually the pitch response is, is almost nothing because the tree has just run out of gas. And this is what happens when trees are stressed. They run out of gas and they're just not able to protect themselves like they could if they were fully healthy. Now, again, stress for a tree can be caused by almost anything. You know, it's from storms, hurricanes, tornadoes, wind and lightning, fire, mechanical damage is really key in urban areas with, you know, Hi, Dave, I apologize. Yes. I'm gonna hey. jump in real quick. People are saying that the presentation is buffering. Um, if you don't mind, let's give it just a couple seconds and see if see if we can get this thing to clear up. I think people okay. are just behind on the Let's see. Uh, Kelly says she hit the refresh button and it fixed the buffering. Um, Judy, Joel, Amanda, David, do you mind trying to hit the refresh button? We're just going to hold on a minute. And I'm just keeping an eye on the chat box, so we're not going to keep going until we, we're sure that everyone's with us. Yep, sounds good. And someone told me that the refresh did work for them just now, so. Okay, all right, Matt says refresh worked for him. Um, how about Joel, Amanda? Oh, uh, yep, Yvette says it works. Okay, if you don't, if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna go ahead and have us keep going just so we can get through the material. Do you want me to cover anything again, Chris, or just keep, keep rolling? I think keep going, people are saying they're good. Okay. So tree susceptibility, this all gets down to the stress levels, right? And we mentioned that they can occur, a stress can occur from almost anything. Storms are huge factors, anything weather related, whether it's lightning or hurricanes, tornadoes, all of these things, stress trees. And sometimes that wind damage, you might not see a tree, uh, it, it might not look like the tree was injured, but that wind, when it whips those trees around, it can cause lots of little micro fractures in the bark. Uh, mechanical damage is key, especially in urban areas with trucks, with construction. That stuff often uh, often causes some issues. Drought is something that is, you know, it's always a threat at this point. 
uh, trees need a certain amount of water to live. And when it doesn't rain for weeks on end, the trees get stressed. Um, it's fairly straightforward and easy to water smaller trees in your yard. But if you've got a bunch of great big trees in a county park or something, you're not going to water, you know, five acres. So those are things that we just kind of need to deal with. And of course, there's the biotic stuff. Uh, vegetation competes. You know, if there's a lot of a lot of green means everything's competing, right? So there's some trade-offs to be had there. There's also, you know, more insects. So now we'll talk about a few caterpillars. And, and caterpillars come in many shapes and forms, and they come in many different population sizes. There's lots of caterpillars that just eat the leaves off a particular branch, or they might nibble a leaf here and there. There's also some cases where caterpillars get into great big outbreaks, and these things are cyclical, meaning they'll start and then they'll stop and then they'll start and stop again. This picture here is from taken in June, and this is a forest tent caterpillar outbreak. Those caterpillars have stripped the leaves off those entire trees at this, this area. And it, you know, on one hand, it also does a lot of damage to those trees. They've got to take resources from the roots and put it, put it back up into the leaves. But it's also really gross, and this is where you get uh, some issues, especially in parks. If you have caterpillar outbreaks, that means there's going to be uh, two things. If there's a whole, if there's thousands of caterpillars above your head eating, those caterpillars are all also pooping. So there's going to be frass. That's our fancy entomology word for poop. Poop is going to be raining down on the picnic tables and the people. And then when these caterpillars are ready to make chrysalises or cocoons, usually they are going to be all over you know, the house. Look at that house. There's all those white things or cocoons. And this is not something that a lot of people are pretty excited about, right? Nobody wants to go to the park and get rained on by poop and then see cocoons all over the place. That said, it happens, you know, and some of the main uh, caterpillars that will do this, the forest tent caterpillar is one. Um, these caterpillars feed together when they're young and then they get uh, as they get bigger, they spread out a little bit, turn into a little brown moth. You've also got canker worms. This is the your standard inchworm or looper that sort of loops along you know, bit by bit. These also turn into little moths. These are capable of great big outbreaks as well. And then fall webworms. They typically don't outbreak and defoliate whole trees. It can happen. But these are the ones that put those webs on the end of tree branches. So especially in late summer, they look... Uh, you know, pretty, pretty scuzzy in my opinion. It looks a little rough, but it's just typically just taking a, a branch here and there. Now, especially for webworms, we'll talk about these for a minute because we get so many calls. Webworms usually don't hurt a tree because they're just going to take a branch here, branch there. You can see they're at the end of branches. Now, the damage is unsightly to most people, but it's probably not going to be detrimental. Um, and, you know, we typically just tell people if you don't like that, you can just sort of rip that web open and it will, it will go away. So there's lots of different, lots of caterpillars is the, is the thing. And, you know, even healthy trees will get some defoliation on them and that's okay. That's just part of the cycle. One thing to remember is caterpillars are bird food. And if you've got a bunch of caterpillars out there, that means you've probably also got a healthy bird population, which especially in these urban areas, a lot of people like to see, especially if they're looking in some of the more natural spots, uh, parks and that type of thing. Ambrosia beetles are very common. There's hundreds of species of ambrosia beetles out there, and they're practically everywhere you can think of. Forest nurseries, anywhere in the city, the park, your yard, they are pretty much everywhere. And ambrosia beetles are tiny little things. Here you can see one on the tip of a finger. They come in lots of different shapes and sizes. And what these do, now we talked about bark beetles earlier, how they eat the green, the phloem of the tree. Ambrosia beetles are just drilling into that tree to make a house. They have little pockets on their head or their shoulder area that carry fungus. And as they make these galleries inside the tree, the spores get on the inside of that, that gallery and the fungus grows. And that's how you see in these pictures, it's whitish or darkish, depending on the species of mole of fungus. They eat the fungus, their larvae eat the fungus, and they just sort of do their thing that way. This is what you typically see from ambrosia beetles, and these are common in urban areas because you've got these stressed trees, and, and ambrosia beetles are very much attracted to stressed trees. These little things, we call them toothpicks or noodles, they are a combination of sawdust and poop and maybe some fungus that grows. 
If there's ever a tree and you see it, it has these things on it, that basically means that tree is toast. It's probably not going to come back because it was already stressed and now it has these ambrosial beetles. A couple of the really, really big ones to know in terms of invasive species in urban trees. First is the emerald ash borer. This is arguably the worst non-native forest pest that we've seen in this generation. Its damage has been at least millions of trees and billions of dollars. Uh, the life cycle for EAB, these adults will come out in late spring in these nice D-shaped exit holes. They mate, they feed a little bit. That really doesn't do a whole lot of damage. Lay eggs on the trees. This is only ash trees, mind you, only fraxinous trees. Uh, and then the larvae is the life stage that does the damage. So the larvae feeds on that phloem, and in some cases it's extensive. It will just consume every bit of that phloem. And then they pupate, and then the cycle starts over. Fortunately, there are lots of chemical control options for emerald ash borers. Uh, there's systemic things. You can do a, a soil drench. You can spray it. Very common to inject these things. If you have an ash tree that needs to be protected or saved, it can be done. But something has to be done because there, if there is EAB in the area, it's probably going to find that ash tree. Another one of our big ones, especially in South Carolina, is the Asian longhorn beetle. So we first found this pest in South Carolina just over two years ago. Uh, it's, it's a fairly good sized beetle. There's me holding one in my hand. Uh, the females will chew these oviposition pits. They're these little hollowed out, almost inverse cones on the edge of the tree. And then she whips around and lays an egg in each one of those things. So this is, right now, these are confined to the Charleston area, Charleston County around Hollywood and Ravenel. Uh, after those eggs hatch, those larvae start feeding. And that's typically when you see uh, the tree bleeds a little bit. It just kind of oozes some sap. And this is mostly red maple trees. As those larvae get larger, they turn and they go into the tree. So you see the sawdust starting to come out from the larval feeding. And then this is a damage, right? It's almost always the larvae for these beetles. These things, you know, where EAB ate the phloem, ALB, Asian longhorn beetle, just tunnels through the wood. And it basically makes Swiss cheese out of the inside of branches and the stems. And it really ruins the structural integrity, the strength of that tree. So you have lots of broken and falling branches all over the place. This was one near our study site and here I'm holding the end of it in my hand and you can see every one of those arrows points to a hole or a tunnel chewed by those ALB larvae. So they're very, very detrimental and, and they're just really destructive. Next pest we don't have yet, but in my opinion, we will probably get pretty soon uh, is the spotted lanternfly. I know Chris has these where she lives and uh, we don't have them in South Carolina yet. They are getting closer. This is a major pest of fruit trees and vines. Honestly, any, any woody thing with smooth bark is probably going to get hit by these. They're pretty good size. There's one on my finger. They're bright. They're colorful. The nymphs have this bright red and black and, and white spots. Um, and then the adults have those wings. Here is your current distribution of spotted lanternfly. Uh, if it's blue, that's where it is. You can see there's populations all the way into the, getting into the Midwest, Virginia and North Carolina, uh, up into the, the Northeast. It's only a matter of time before this comes to South Carolina, I'm afraid. So I think it's, it's good to just be aware of what it is. And if anyone sees one, please report it right away. Um, and then let's talk about just a few non-native plants. So before I get on my my soapbox, I want folks to know that are all non-native plants bad? They're not, right? So non-native plants by themselves are not necessarily horrible. All of these things are non-native, potatoes, oranges, corn. We don't see these non-native plants growing wild in the ditches, right? You don't have potatoes taking over fields and stuff. Uh, so some non-native plants are bad. And even some invasive plants can be okay in the right location. So uh, if any of you know me, I am not a fan of bamboo in any way, shape, or form. But in this particular environment where it's completely enclosed by concrete, it's fine. It's not going anywhere, right? In terms of bamboo, there's two different kinds of bamboo. There's, there's this, it's a perennial grass. So there's this clumping type where you plant it, and then it sort of grows in a big circle. And then there's the runners where you plant them, and they send long shoots out, and sprouts pop up from them. Like I said, in the right environment, bamboo can be okay. 
this is completely surrounded by concrete. It's not going anywhere. But if it is not in that environment, it is probably not going to be okay because it will never just stay where you put it without a barrier. And then let's talk about cattle repair. So this is a common, a commonly planted throughout the Southeast for a long time, uh, also known as the Bradford pear. This is, you know, your typical Bradford pear in spring. Yes, it has very pretty flowers, but if any of you have smelled it, it's got a very uh, unique scent. This is one of my favorite uh, descriptions for the scent. It's pungent, right? And so the Bradford pear was commercially released, uh, what are we coming up on, 60 years ago now. Uh, they knew it escaped cultivation. It was it was released and said, oh, it's a sterile cultivar. Mm. Uh, they knew it had escaped. They noticed the structural problems around the 80s. That's because when it gets to be about 20-ish, 25 years old, it just starts to fall apart. But it was such a huge moneymaker, it just kind of kept going. And they knew some things about Bradford Pear all along. They knew that there were branch structure issues. Okay, If you, if you sneeze at it wrong, it's going to fall apart. It was marketed as sterile, but, you know, um, any other pyrus can make a, a viable seed. So if you've got a, a whole town, let's say, nothing but Bradford pears in there, they can't pollinate themselves. So none of those seeds will be viable, but it just takes that that one guy on the street to plant different cultivar of it, a Chanticleer or something else. Then all of a sudden you've got different pollen, and that can make every one of those seeds on the Bradford pear sterile because they're pollinated by something else. People knew this and their response was just sort of to throw their hands up because these things were selling and we're still dealing from the fallout of this now. So, you know, I'm going to talk about planting native species, but this is a classic case of why you should plant, why you should, why I encourage you to plant native species as you're doing your landscape planning. Because of that, we've got this calorie pair all over the place, old fields, roadsides, first white trees in the spring, in these unsold lots, it's even creeping into forests. Um, you know, and some would say, well, who cares? It's a nice, pretty white tree, right? And it is absolutely beautiful. And yes, it's, it's pretty in the spring. I'll give you that. The problem though, is that once these calorie pears kind of get into the wild and go wild, they've got these crazy thorns on them. These thorns are dangerous to animals. They're dangerous to people. They cost people a lot of money to try to get rid of, and they just take over everywhere. Uh, one of our Former grad students looked at some of the genetics of these things, and they're basically the poster child for an invasive species. This, this plant right here is the poster child. Uh, and then I think it's always good. I love showing this picture. This is a street in North Georgia. You've got some Bradford pears right there. Uh, they were pollinated by other things, and then all of a sudden other, other pyrus. Uh, birds eat them, and you see as the birds take off and fly across that field, leaving in their their uh, wake as they fly off and poop they drop the seeds and you've got these calorie pears growing up everywhere so i am once again asking you to plant native species in urban landscapes um, the non-native stuff i know they're always coming out with with cultivars that are supposed to be sterile and and that type of thing but bradford pear was touted as sterile as well and we're at a real mess with it at this point so why should you plant native species over non-natives, right? So trying to make my case here. Well, the first thing is just for the wildlife and for the environment. Uh, we mentioned caterpillars before. Some little birds need thousands of caterpillars every spring just to raise a clutch of eggs. Birds, there's lots of research out there in neighborhoods where there are more native tree species, you have more birds and better wildlife. This has like been shown in multiple, multiple places. There's also lots of data out there to show the impacts on people's well-being and health by having a healthy urban tree environment. Uh, people like trees. They like to walk under trees. They like to see green living things. And this just makes them, makes them happy and helps out. And finally, there's an economic aspect to it. Ask any one of those municipalities who has a lot of Bradford pears planted how much money it costs them after any storm to pick up branches that have snapped off. Most of the time, your native tree species are going to be better equipped to handle some of the weather things we get in this part of the world. And so it just makes better economic sense to plant stuff that's not going to take a whole bunch of effort to, to, to repair and, or to pick up after, after every event. Hopefully at this point you're saying, fine, then I'll plant natives. What should I plant? And I, you know, I've made this argument and Francis and I have talked about this for every for every characteristic of a non-native plant, 
there's a native that fits that niche. Do you want pretty red fall color? Try Schumard Oak. Try Black Tupelo. These things are absolutely gorgeous. You want pretty yellow fall color? How about one of the hickories? Those things are beautiful, you know? What if you're after flowers? What if I want some of those white flowers? Well, how about a white fringe tree? And I know some have said, well, a white fringe tree might be a host for emerald ash borer. I don't think there's, there's no evidence that I've seen that shows that emerald ash borer in the deep south is going to just go through and mow down fringe trees. Where fringe tree got hit was up in Ohio. It was where EAB populations were sky high. And it was kind of like EAB had already eaten all the ash. There are high populations. It had to eat something. I still think it's totally fine to plant French tree. Red Buckeye is a gorgeous tree. Silver Bell is a great little native tree. Some of the resources that Chris is going to get you have a, a lot of options for native trees. And in some cases, yeah, it might take a little effort to find them. But I really think that at the end of the day, it's a much better investment. And it's going to look just as good, if not better, on that landscape. So, you know, we want to be a resource to you. If you've got problems or questions like who do you, what do you do, who do you call? I mean, obviously, Francis and her team, uh, this is what they do. This is directly from their webpage. We provide technical and or educational assistance regarding community forest inventories and management plans, how to become a tree city, how to handle things. This is what your fo these folks do. There's also Clemson Extension. Uh, every county has uh, an extension office, a horticulture agent, a forestry natural resources agent. Every, you know, if there's folks on here that are not from South Carolina, every state has a land grant extension group that can help with things like this. And this is what we are here for is to answer these type of calls. And then there's consulting arborists. You know, they can help. Uh, you can go to that website and, and find one in your local area. They can help with all the, the type of tree things as well. There's a Facebook group that, that I'm a part of, Southern Tree Health Diagnostics. You can go on there if you have a question about tree health, a couple pictures, tell us about it. And we've got a number of experts that check this all the time. And I would say there are other Facebook groups too, but those can give you a lot of great information, but you have to make sure it's, it's run by a reputable source first. That said, I wanted to leave some time for questions that I have, and I am happy to take questions. Apologize for the buffering earlier. If there's anything you all want me to uh, go over again, I am more than happy to do so. Perfect. Thank you, Dave. I'm going to go ahead and take the screen share back. Um, here we are. So actually, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and just leave our faces on here. Does anyone have any questions? It's okay if you don't. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pop the polls, all the polls up so that if you guys are thinking about if you're having questions, um, you know, you can have time to formulate those. I don't. OK, I just put all the polls in here and I'm checking in the question and answers. I don't see anything in there yet. Um, I do want to say thank you to Dave for a really informative presentation. I think that a lot of these things are. A lot of these topics are things that people can use on a daily basis and um, kind of have some fun with as you're walking around seeing what you see. Yeah, so, and I would encourage, you know, as you're designing some of these landscapes, I always make the argument that, look, everyone's got a red maple tree. Those are lame at this point. Like, put something else in there. Everyone's got the same stuff so, so often. And, you know, when you go through a neighborhood and you see a house that has something unique and different, people notice that. That's why things like those, those, some of these native flowering trees are awesome and they're just so underused. The red buckeye is so cool. The silver bell is so neat. There's lots of great things that can be put in there that aren't your boilerplate, you know, red maple, which seems to be everywhere all the time. And, you know, the other thing that we didn't mention is, you know, one of the issues in a lot of our urban planning is just the planting of the same thing because it works and because it's easy. Back in the 60s and 70s, American elm was used in so many urban areas. And then all of a sudden, Dutch elm disease came in, and non-native invasive fungus basically wiped them out, right? And, and municipalities spent tons of money cutting down these elm trees. What did they replace most of them with? Ash, right? So that's why ash is such, and it's a great urban tree, don't get me wrong, but when it's planted all over the place, 
then when you get the emerald ash borer type thing, that's when half the continent has been struggling to get these ash out of there. And those things, when they die, they get brittle fast. So you've got to get them out of there. There's liability. And I worry as someone who works in invasive species, I worry that we're, you know, we're the next red maple borer insect or whatever away from losing all the maples because they're just everywhere. So diversifying those urban canopies is, is so key and so critical. It's going to look nice. It's going to save, you know, municipalities money. It's going to just contribute to an overall healthier ecosystem. So that's one of the main reasons I try to encourage people. Plant some different stuff in there. You know, it just, it just looks, so there's a lot of reasons to do that. Excellent. And then while we were just chatting, we had a couple of questions come in. So first one is from Eric Schultz. He says best means to eradicate tallow in the low country landscape. Yeah, tallow is tricky because it's just so, you know, it's it's so prevalent down there. I guess it depends. The best way to eradicate most invasive plants is with herbicides. Um, it depends. Are you talking about one tallow tree or are you talking about acres of tallow tree? If it's if they're small and there's not too many, sometimes you can pull the things up, believe it or not. Uh, if there's a lot of them, you're probably looking at herbicide. Um, if it's in a type of area where you could actually burn, sometimes that can kill some of the little ones, but it, it, I'd have to know a little bit more about how much and how big. Um, and that's kind of the, the first thing we always try to get when it comes to dealing with some of these invasive plants. The technique you do to get rid of them depends on how much of it and how big are they. Excellent. And then Yvette has a question. Are there any citizen programs available to conduct a tree canopy assessment or a tree inventory for your town or community? And for that question, Francis is the best. Mm -hmm. Francis, do you mind popping back on? Yes, I was trying to find everything to click. So now Yvette, she was asking about um, the citizen programs. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. So um, I'm not aware of any community doing that right now. There's like some iTree programs that would, you know, if should a community want to do something like that, they could. Um, but it does involve a lot of investment and kind of training in the volunteers to make sure that you get the kind of information that you want. And I haven't seen that going on um, in any South Carolina communities in particular. But um, it would be something that we'd be, we'd be happy to help mm -hmm. with if there was a community interested in, in working out something like that. Excellent. And if you don't mind, Frank, I'm going to go ahead and pop your email address in here so that you can reach back out directly about that. Oh, thanks. Um, and then Virginia, go ahead. I was going to say, I see Virginia's uh, question there. Any problem with monoculture of live oak? Live oak is tricky. You know, it's a, it's a native. It's great in some of those coastal areas. I think my my boilerplate answer is there's there's always potentially a problem with any monoculture, right? Because if you've got one thing, it's always possible for a pest of some type, whether it's native or invasive, to mow through that one thing and then you've lost all of it. Um, that being said, I understand the allure of the live oak and it is a native and it, it does a lot of great things for the environment. So uh, that's a tricky one, but I would say if at all possible, I would encourage avoiding monocultures, though I understand in some cases they're going to be there. Is that, that's kind of my way of waffling around that one, I think, but, um, you know, it's, it's, monocultures are, are just more risky than a, than a more diverse uh, landscape. So if you're willing to take on those risks, then it's just something you have to be comfortable with. Got it. And we have a question from Amanda. She says, we had a discussion at the Charleston BZASD about whether the about whether the weather was affecting hackberry trees rather than a specific blight. Any ideas? Yeah, the hackberry decline, they're calling it. And that goes all the way from Charleston all the way up to Augusta, kind of in that Savannah River corridor there. Um, we don't know what is going on there yet. Um, there's a lot of things they have found that is that are associated with it. There's a buprested beetle. There's some, I think there's an aphid. There's some fungus. Um, that is a really really good question. And I, at this point, I do not have an answer um, why those hackberry trees are are petering out like that. Uh, 
could be the weather could be it could be you know we've thought about well is it soils is it weather is it you know this that and the other and we just haven't gotten any clarity on that yet folks from the forest service are working on that quite a bit though the, out of the athens group mm -hmm. that makes sense all right i think that I, those are all the questions that i see i'm just going to wait one minute to see if anyone else has anything um if you do pop it in either the chat box or in the ask a question either one is fine and just a reminder that if you do need the credits, the SCPEAC, you email me. I'm going to pop my email address in there. If you need the ISA, email me. And do me a favor, when you email me asking for ISA credits, go ahead and email me your ISA number at the same time. Um, and the planner's credits, I can tell you how to log your credits if you don't know already. So all three things to email. Mm -hmm. And other than that, oh, I think we are good. So a big thank you to Dave. We appreciate you coming on, sharing what you know. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Take care.